I want to learn to be the ultimate crowd controller. I think that's a funny thing about crowds. You can never really control the way that they behave. Or can you? This audience of 8,000 people has gathered to watch a national institution, the proms. But I'm going on first, about to entertain this crowd by convincing them that something dreadful's about to happen. No, I haven't taken up the cello, but what I'm about to do will probably cause just as much shock and amazement. I'm going to perform with one of my favorite instruments. This is what I do. I make audiences believe they're watching the impossible by twisting their tiny minds. Tonight, my instrument of mentalism is the six-inch surgical steel spike. All right, wish me luck. Good to meet everybody. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Everyone excited about this evening's proms? Well, you'll be delighted to hear I'm only going to be on stage for about four or five hours. I'm David Mead and I'm a mentalist. No, that doesn't mean I'm a crazy fool. I'm a performer who entertains people with tricks that mess with their minds. And one solid steel spike knot. Whoa. Now, no, I want you to check that and make sure that that's absolutely solid. It it's pretty, pretty spiky to me. Yeah, it isn't telescopic, it doesn't unscrew and it won't fall out the bottom. Okay. Happy no? Uh, very well. I wouldn't say I was happy, but... <laughs> the steel spike ensures that I have the undivided attention from this evening's host, Noel Thompson, who thinks he might get his hand skewered. All right, Noel. Noel, if I had to ask you, based even on odds alone, would you say this is more likely to be safe or dangerous? Bearing in mind, Noel, it's only a one in four. Well, what are you going to do? Well, if... <laughs> <laughs> Now, no, well, if you had to guess, it's only a one well, in four. Well, on the basis, one in four chance, I'd say it's going to be safe. OK, so statistically, it feels like it should be safe. All right, no, lean forward for me. So, folks, I need you to count from five to one, and then very slowly we'll press down, all right? Start with me. Five. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Oh, shit. <laughs> Good decision, no. Good decision. But I can't forget that while I'm on stage, I have to keep the crowd completely engaged in what's going on. Yeah, no it's yeah. a one in three, if you had it's to guess, more likely to be safe or dangerous. Well, it's still more likely to be safe. All right, Noel, face away for me. No, no. When can I say no thanks? <laughs> and folks, five again for me. Five, five four, four, three. three. <laughs> that was just for theater, Noel. I'm sorry about that one. Let's hear it for Noel, everyone. Good decision. <laughs> Right, folks, we're down to two cups. When we're down to two what? cups, that the adrenaline really starts to flow. <laughs> folks, can you sense the adrenaline on stage? It's it's called fear, not adrenaline. I have to manipulate what the crowd see. Now, Noel, in a moment, I'm going to have you raise one hand, any hand that you like, high up into the air. Don't think about it. Don't say a word. Raise one hand high up into the air. Go ahead and do it. That one. Are you certain? Put that behind. What they think they see. <sighs> Oh, you poor wee chicken. <laughs> and most importantly, when they think back, what they thought they saw. They're all the time, ladies and gentlemen. Let's Ouch! Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you very much indeed. Standing in front of the proms audience has started me thinking. I've worked with audiences large and small all through my career, but I've never really thought enough about what makes a crowd tick. I think I need to look outside the world of mentalism to see if crowds can be manipulated in the everyday world. I want to see if there are scientific techniques to controlling large groups. I want to find out if anyone out there is using these techniques. More importantly, would they be any use to me as a mentalist? Can you really control crowds, or is it just a trick of the mind? Where better to start my journey than in a place I know crowds gather regularly? And most of us join them at least once a week for a bit of what we think is innocent retail therapy. 
I don't think that when I enter a retail space like this, I don't feel like I'm being manipulated. But is, is the word manipulate unfair? Is it too strong a word? Or is that really happening every well, day? Some of the literature um, around the whole retail store patronage actually talks about manipulation and talks about manipulation in two ways. Manipulation by projecting a certain image. But the other way, and that's probably the more contentious way, is actually manipulating how consumers move around the store. A new era of prosperity and better living. Like most things in our culture related to shopping and retail, the concept of the shopping centre came from America. But the man credited with inventing the shopping centre was born in Austria, architect Victor Gruen. During the 50s and 60s, Victor Gruen's work transformed city centres all over America, creating the shopping mall. But experts and academics have always suspected there's more going on here than meets the eye. If you look at the store environment, the store environment is essentially a tool. So they have a number of different strategies. For example, within the store um, layout, if we look at different floor plans, uh -huh. we're looking at the way the aisles are constructed, the flow of traffic. There's ways of manipulating consumers. What was an ordinary main street is now an extraordinary place designed for the enjoyment of people. Victor Gruen was accused of a bit of mind manipulation himself. It has been claimed that his shopping mall layouts were deliberately confusing and distracting, so the customers would lose track of the original reason they came into the shopping mall and end up buying everything in sight. Of course, Victor Gruen himself denied such manipulative techniques, but there's no doubt that modern-day shopping centres are designed to sell. This massive big piece of architecture in the middle it looks beautiful, but it pr it also stops us bypassing all these shops. It forces us to go out right and around them. It's called the race course effect, and that is forcing us as consumers. You can't just, you know, go straight down the middle. You actually have to go right round to even move out of the shopping centre. And some of the environmental psychology theory refers to the pad paradigm, and essentially it's about pleasure, arousal and dominance, and how those emotional responses persuade consumers to buy in a certain way. It's pretty obvious how shopping centres stimulate our pleasure and arouse us with pretty lights, the latest tunes, and even nice smells like fresh bread. But dominance? That sounds like the kind of tactic I might use in mentalism. I never realised that shops could be using it on me. I mean, there's one particular big furniture shop that, that I spend, uh, you know, a fair bit of time in and also trying to get out of at times um, because there is one path that is moderated and mediated by even big arrows on the floor. And that's manipulation by dominance, dominating the flow of traffic by the consumer where they actually have to go a certain way and in many ways can't get out of the store unless they've actually bypassed every single display on the way. One well-known large furniture store uses dominance in a very clever way. It forces people to follow the path around the store. On the one hand, some shoppers accept this dominance and follow the path. But on the other hand, some clever clogs reject the dominance and start looking for shortcuts. Academics believe the store uses this dominance to deliberately frustrate both character types. At the end of the pathway is a marketplace where dominance no longer applies. Released from control, both types unleash their natural instinct to make free choices, and they shop like wild things, filling their baskets just as the store planned. It must work with me because I never manage to leave that shop without something in my trolley, even if I'm just in for a wander around. Because always... it would be soul destroying after, after <laughs> several hours. <laughs> It turns out I use a bit of dominance in my own act. And in this environment, frankly, I just can't help myself. And I found the perfect participants in Katie and Kira. Kira. Katie and Kira, lovely. Thanks for helping me. I really like crowds because they make me feel excited. I hate crowds, sorry, no, it's not for me. I'm going to ask Kira to take an imaginary walk around the city in her head. The question is can I know in advance where she might end up? I'm fascinated by the way that people behave, you know, especially when they're in groups and crowds. Yeah. And when I look around this place, it's amazing. I see pockets of people sort of conforming together, like groups, like crowds. And, and you know, every time that uh, an architect designs a place like this, they design it with certain things in mind. Like, for instance, the blue tiles that you see on the floor, 
they're not there just to look good. They're there to guide people through all of the stores. And if you'll notice, they take them past all of the special offers. So, what's going to happen is, I'm going to show you this map. Now look closely, folks. I've already made my prediction. You can genuinely think of anywhere. So stare at it. Think about where we are now, first of all. We're clearly in uh, Victoria Square. You can see it kind of uh -huh. down there, Victoria Square. Now I want you to have a look at You could go genuinely anywhere in this city, anywhere that you like. Can I have your hand? Yeah. Now, all you need to do, actually, Katie, if you could hold down that edge yeah. for me, and I'll hold down this edge. Now, tell me, do you like crowds? Yeah. You do? OK, so you like busy places. So you will have chosen, you've gone from Victoria Square. I would say you've probably went up Victoria Street. That's a really busy street. There's a lot of shops, a lot of bars, a lot of restaurants there. So I would guess, don't give me any clues, mm -hmm. but I would guess you've probably gone a busy route. Uh, you probably like partying. Yeah. So you will have spent a bit of time mentally in your head in the cathedral quarter. You've probably spent quite a lot of money there at various points, I would say. Had quite a lot of sore heads in that part of the town. Um, and I would say if I had to guess, There. I think <laughs> you will have stopped in your head at St. Anne's Square. Yeah. Where did you go? <laughs> St. Anne's Square. Really? That's oh genuinely God. in your head, that's where no, you wanted I to go? No, I swear to God, that's where I wanted You're to go. You're joking me. <laughs> now, why did you do that? I actually don't know. You have no idea? Like, you actually know me better than myself. Like, I'm not joking. Like, I actually don't know why I picked that. Oh, my goodness. Is it freaky? It's a wee bit freaky, yeah. What's weird is that um, it's not actually that weird. It's actually fairly simple, really, because when these spaces are designed, they're designed to try and make people behave in certain ways. So a designer, uh, someone who designs these sort of spaces, who wants to manage the crowd and manage individuals, could have designed this city to make one person go any direction they like. Looking at this map, there's only one place that you could have ever have ended up. Yeah. That's why, from the very beginning, on the back of this, I had, uh, I'm going to St. Anne's Square. Oh, my God. You could have gone anywhere. Okay. You were brilliant. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. You were brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> really, like, I know I'm weird. I didn't think he was going to get it, because I changed my mind, like, three times. So hard to know I was going to end up. Like, Especially the way he wrote it on the back yeah. of the map. Oh, Can my you... gosh. It was mad. Wow. Oh, my God. It was oh my God. <laughs> so... I'm a wee bit freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> Why the hell did he do that? Now, the worst nightmare for any performer is when you lose control and the crowd turns into a mob. I want to learn how to deal with a mob, so I've come to London. London is the most densely populated city in Europe and the fourth most densely populated in the world. It has 4,700 people per square kilometre. That's almost five people in every single square metre. Not only is London home to the mother of all parliaments, the modern history of crowd control began right here. So I'm meeting crowd expert Chris Cocking for an insight into the politics of the crowd. So what, what is a crowd? A crowd in its simplest term is two or more people who've come together without any formal decision-making processes. Now, clearly, the vast majority of crowds will be much more than two people. But the point is, is that the way that crowds decide how they behave is very spontaneous. They don't have committees, they don't have elections. Crowd control in history first appeared with this book, The Crowd, by Gustav Le Bon. No, not Simon Le Bon, that's Duran Duran, Gustav Le Bon. He saw the crowd as a mob that needed controlling. He was writing about the crowd in the French Revolution, which, let's face it, is when the powers that be lost control of the crowd and the king lost his head. The political history of mobs in London is less revolutionary. But one incident in particular changed the history of crowd control forever. It happened here in Cable Street in the East End of London in 1936. In 1936, this was a predominantly Jewish area and Oswald Mosley's Black Shirts, um, a fascist organisation that emulated um, Hitler and Mussolini, wanted to march 5,000 fascists down this street into a predominantly Jewish area and the working class population, um, the East End, said no way. On Cable Street, the government saw two faces of the mob that scared them. On one side, the black shirts were organised and violent, just like the Nazis in Germany. On the other side was a crowd equally uncontrollable, basically taking the law into their own hands. 
Just like Gustave Le Bon, the government believed the crowd needed to be controlled and imposed the Public Order Act. It informed the way crowds are controlled in the UK for nearly 50 years. But experts like Chris think the Public Order Act got the crowd all wrong. You've said that you and your colleagues want to reclaim the notion of what a crowd is. Um, why does it need to be reclaimed and what's great about crowds? I suppose the good thing about crowds, and is we find this time and time in the research, is that people who actually experience the crowds often describe them as very positive experiences. They use the word like empowering, exhilarating. Sometimes people use the word festival atmosphere um, to describe their experiences of crowds. And so what we're trying to say is there's often a real mismatch between how people experience crowds and how they're perceived afterwards by the press, by the authorities. Chris's view is that in history, dictators used techniques to appear to control the crowd. The classic footage of Hitler at the Nuremberg rallies, the kind of people that would go to them would be already ideologically committed Nazis who would listen to Hitler favourably. And some of Hitler's speeches, it's just pure repetition, where the crowd and him repeat the same slogan. So there's no kind of detailed content of what he's saying. It just becomes a ritual. Hitler was using a classic technique of call and response. It was a case of, I say Germany, you say Heil. Call and response is popular in African-American churches where it's used to bring the congregation together. And other people use it too. Nice to see you, to see you. The more that I learn about crowds and audiences, the more I realise that um, it's not actually guesswork. There's a huge amount of science behind the way that groups, large and small, but groups uh, of people behave. And I want to find out if some of that science can help to manipulate a crowd. How are you? Thank oh, you very for well, coming. You do, I you? really, really appreciate you coming with me. And I think I found the perfect accomplice. Well, I've done a huge amount of research over the last few months, and your name keeps coming up again and again and again. You've literally written the book on, on crowd management, is that right? Uh, yeah, in fact, the book's about to be written. We've got uh, both the introduction to crowd science and applied crowd science uh, with publication contracts, so yeah. He's being a little bit modest. Keith Stills really is the go-to guy for crowds. Most recently, he's consulted on the Royal Wedding and the Olympics, as well as internationally in the Hajj and festivals in Europe. What are you going to show me today? Um, quite a lot of the techniques, particularly about risk in crowds. Should I be worried? Should I be nervous? Not at all, not at all. We don't do anything that, that doesn't uh, fulfil the necessary requirements of a risk assessment. Excellent, excellent. Keith's science is a relatively new one. The Hillsborough tragedy of 1989 was the watershed moment. After Hillsborough, there was a massive rethink. Crowds didn't just need to be controlled, they needed to be managed. Out of that emerged the science of crowd management. Crowd density and crowd flow. Keith is going to show me a hugely important experiment in that science with a little bit of string. This class is a true representative sample of the subject. 80% of all students of crowd management are female. You put the string around you. Around me? Yeah, and it constrains oh, yeah. density, you see? So you just hold that. <laughs> this is one square metre. And all you need to do is walk up and down like that as if you're chatting to each other. And one of the things to observe is just how people stand what positions they take up. Guys, for instance, are quite comfortable shoulder to shoulder, but when you get into that kind of zone, all of a sudden, personal space becomes invaded. So let's just put three in. And again, same sort of thing, walking up and down. And you often find that is that when the density starts to come constrained, you see how they're walking shoulder to shoulder. If we can get seven in there, they all look about the right size. Keith, I'd love to see a few more people in. Do you want to join in? Don't be shy, don't be shy. <laughs> they won't bite. Not until they get to know you better. I think the big thing for me is that when we look at this crowd, and it is only a small crowd, although it could just be one part of 10,000, one of these individuals doesn't really have control over their own movement because the crowd is all behaving in one way and they must as an individual too. Absolutely. Now, they haven't lost their individuality. They've just lost the degree of freedom. 
don't mind me asking for the fellas. What's the impact of being two lads amongst all the girls? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? A little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why? I feel as though you've got to, well, you need to know where your hands are. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay, all right. <laughs> We're the like twins anyway. <laughs> Just for the fun of it now, if I was to just say stop there, what does that do to everybody? Sends a pulse. Everyone stops. Yeah, but is it? I mean, how does that affect you all the way at the back? Yeah, it's it's not nice. All right, okay. I didn't I didn't mean it like that. I didn't. Mean... All right, okay. It's really interesting to do it with you students here because you're studying events. I mean, what do you think about the science of of, of crowd management? Uh, to be honest. Until this experiment, it was just something that I talked about in class and I worried about after I got a job planning an event or something. You know, when you go to concerts, it's really just an annoyance. It's not something that you really think about, but it, it is definitely now. The 2010 Love Parade in Germany, the original expectation was around 800,000 but closer to 1.4 million turned up. The big mistake occurred when two crowds were directed into one area. No one noticed just how quickly this area was filling up with people until it was too late. 21 people lost their lives and more than 500 were injured. We have a database now going back uh, about 100 years of all the major accidents and incidents. The analysis of that has given us the, the DNA of a crowd accident. Um, what are the fundamental elements that give rise to risk and subsequently injury, fatalities and incidents? And the courts don't really understand this as yet. The, you know, the impression is the crowd stampede or panic, therefore the crowd was at fault. But there are underlying causes to most of these things. How big of a role does panic play in these uh, crowd emergencies? It's actually very rare. Panic is uh, generally one of the last things a crowd does when all options are expired. And we tend to use the phrase that the crowd isn't, uh, didn't uh, die because they panic. People are panicking because they're dying. So it's one of the final sets of actions. But it really depends on how you would define panic. For instance, running away from a fire is a perfectly natural reaction. If you are suddenly transfixed by the situation, like a rabbit caught in the headlights, that's more of a panic response where your, your central nervous system You're shuts irrationally down. irrationally locked. You become irrationally locked. In this section, we have uh, one square metre. Back again with his trusty bit of string, Keith marks out just one metre square. He's going to show me the most important technique he teaches, recognising crowd density. Keith trains all his students in this critical skill. Can we get up a third, please? And again, now take the position as if you're at a concert, you want to watch the event. The secret is to spot in an instant if the crowd are reaching critical density. Crowd managers must be able to spot this in amongst the crowd or more likely when using CCTV cameras. Just by how easily an individual can walk through a group, they can work out what the density is. It's in uh, fact, you can do this from uh, even very crowded environments, just being able to watch how crowds move. Well, I think they look fairly comfortable in there, Keith, so let's ramp this up a bit. So this is about your upper limit now for a spectator's area. Now, I'm just going to illustrate this. I'm going to give a slight push on the corner, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to give you a slight push. OK, plenty of space to adjust your position. Well, five seems a controllable number, but what difference will one or two or even three more bodies make to this tiny space? How does it feel, guys? Comfortable? Again, I'm not going to push you any harder or any softer than I did before. There's the shockwave. Ooh. OK. Now, this is the point where we have significant risk to the crowd. For those of you who have been on the London Underground, I mean, is, is this much far off what, what some of you have experienced? No. 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 You know, it's pretty close, isn't it? You've been yeah. like this before. I mean, is this a common occurrence on the Underground, Keith? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as I say, crush loading in Underground is about eight people per square metre. But what is interesting is you're not actually legal allowed to transport cattle to this level of density. You would be prosecuted for it but we can move people through the London Underground at this level, so... If you don't mind, I'm going to try and walk through, all right? So, um, if you need to step out of the square, that's all right, but know that, you know, you've let me down, you've let yourselves down. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to try and do it in a bit of a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> like that. 
I've had audiences of eight people and 8,000 people. And truthfully, from my point of view, the crowd, I always thought, were in control. If they wanted to stampede or run or, 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 or invade the stage, that is their want. But this experiment, more than anything other, has shown me that one person can create a serious disaster. What's great about Keith's approach is that his experiments are so simple to perform and easy to understand. But there's something else about Keith that's blown me away. It's not just an interest in crowd science we have in common. Like me, Keith's a mentalist. You can understand that 100 years ago, when a, a magician could focus your attention on a tiny point in space and time while he pulled a rabbit out of the hat, how they did that was to be able to understand the crowd's perception. So where we use it is to understand where signage is most appropriate, what type of signage works, how do we inform the crowd, how do we understand if the crowd are responding to that information. Now those are exactly the same techniques that a mentalist would use, but in a slightly different way. We're using it very much focused on crowd safety. Take, for instance, um, if I just, if I can take it off, in fact, the wedding ring. I, I mean, this was made uh, from uh, Orkney Gold. My wife had it made for me, and I've been married 17 years. And it's, it's a phenomenal design, but of course, uh, the band represents, uh, you know, the, the sanctity of marriage, etc. But of course, it's not the same unless you have just a little piece of magic. Wow. So, so just, just, just to be clear, so you had it, so how, now I'm, sitting right here, but you had it there. And in, in an instant, it was... I'm just gonna... You can try and take it off, yeah. How did you do that? I suppose my job is um, knowing and understanding audiences and making sure that I suppose I, I try to control their attention and control what they think and what they feel. It's incredible to me to think that the, uh, the authority in the country, the man who's quite literally written the book on this, uses mentalism to control and manage crowds to keep them safe and the way that they think and do things. And, I don't know, I just, I suppose I feel like a bit of an amateur, you know? I'm just using it to guess pin numbers. <laughs> Back home, and I want to put what I've learned about crowd management to the test. Let's face it, Northern Ireland has a bit of a reputation for crowds not behaving themselves. I'm about to face probably the biggest crowd of the year that Belfast has to offer. I am not a big boy, you know, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to tell anyone what to do, you know. I mean, if someone bumps into me, I'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry, would you like some tea? Tonight, I'm out on the streets in Belfast. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Culture Night. Tonight is Culture Night in Belfast. It's one of the biggest event nights in the calendar. And there's nearly 50,000 people coming into Belfast tonight. And um, I'm going to be part of the security for this just to see how the crowd behave. This is the night that Belfast really comes alive. 42,000 people will descend on the city to watch street performers, dancers, and a massive parade in a carnival atmosphere. Events like this have made Belfast one of the top 10 tourist destinations in the world, and a million miles from Belfast's troubled past. But before all that, I'm getting the 515 briefing where every detail of tonight's activity is discussed, and nothing is left to chance. Was this your, is this your first time, is it? No, well, second one, but the uh, first, first one. Oh, is it? Right, right. Well, like it you don't have one of our T-shirts on yet? No. OK, you need to have one of our T-shirts on, so if you put that on for me. Right, will do. Roll your hood up and put it away for us as well, please. Thank will you. do, yeah. Test problem. Uh, Culture Night has been running since 2009. It started off with around 15,000, and then it's got bigger every year. Andrew McQuillan is the main man running crowd management tonight. His team will use any tools at their disposal, including monitoring social media. 
We're watching the Twitter feeds and everyone's going mad about this, so you know, there's going to be a big crowd tonight. They do this to get a handle on where the crowd is moving before it even gets there. Less and less space between the people. And look at this, brushing up on their crowd density. Keith Stills would be proud. Can you see? When you get to four and five, you can really only see their heads. And, you know, three per square metre, people are touching you, around you. Four, you're being touched on all sides. And five, you, it, you, it's, you can't move through the crowd easily at all. That's it, OK, we're going to give you out your seats now. So, everyone understand that, OK? These are the most important things here, you know, this crowd density. Um, and my job is to spot when it's getting to, like, a really dangerous, unmanageable level, you know. No more chat and rehearsal. This is it. My first time out on the street. There's still only a few people out and about at the moment. But believe me, there's already millions of butterflies in my stomach. Do you get scared? Does it scare you? I wouldn't say I get scared. I mean, the thing is, I know from experience, the more you plan, the easier it is. Yeah, yeah. If, I did, if we didn't, like, we've done two and a half months planning. Uh, the crowd management plan for this event was over 100 hours work. And we measured every street around here. Every street we measured. Length and the breadth and all the pinch points. So my job is to keep people away from the wheel. Your my job? Yes. Your, uh, your job, as all our stewards do, you're putting yourself, you know, on the line, if you like. Um, and where, where's the 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 where, where would I get a taxi? Where's the nearest, <laughs> where's the nearest taxi? <laughs> but as the crowd builds, I have to remember, they're all here to have fun. But from my perspective, even the smallest thing could end in tears. Excuse me, excuse me, do you want to come down there? We don't want you falling there. Come on ahead, do you want a hand? I give you a wee hand. Good man. High five, angry bird. Or not, whatever. <laughs> One or two. Big hit for the kids. The centrepiece of Culture Night, the Carnival Parade, has just begun. And this is where crowd management comes into sharp focus. So, Andy, we have a street here. How wide is this? Approximately 18 metres. About 18 metres. Yeah. Now, that entire parade needs to squeeze into this street. Yes. And what width would that be? Uh, 9.8. I think we measured that. Half, half the size? About that, yes. So it's, what's, it's... what's the impact of that? Well, um, as my professor says at university, it's like putting an egg back in the chicken. It doesn't quite <laughs> fit. This crowd has tens of thousands of people in it. Where yeah. do we need to be right now? Over there. Right, right. Yes. Let's go. Let's go. Basically, uh, we have a street there that is uh, roughly about 20 metres wide. 20 metres wide. In the space of about four metres, that has to compress down to less than 10 metres. What that means is an amount of people that are this width needs to compress down to roughly half its size. But more importantly, they need to do that safely. And it's my job to do it. One thing I've got to remember, despite hundreds of people blocking the road, this parade cannot stop. This is the only part of Culture Night that must run to time. The procession has to be over by precisely 9.15 or risk ruining the grand finale. So if you just want to ask me to move around the car? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, folks, do you want to keep in there? Thousands and thousands of people. I just don't want you to get trampled down, that's all. Excellent. Off onto the pavement there if you can, folks. Sorry, I just don't want you to get trampled. Thanks very much. Just have you onto the pavement there, folks. Thank you. I think the weirdest thing for me is that it's easy for I thought the crowd was there, when in actual fact that crowd is about to meet a brand new, impromptu, unplanned for crowd that they need to merge into. And um, I think that's the funny thing about crowds. You can never really control the way that they behave. Well, or can you? The parade culminates outside the cathedral. Not only is this where the crowd density is at its highest, but there are all manner of participants. Sorry. The flames coming through there, folks. If I could just get you a bit wider for the flames. There are carnival dinosaurs, and this chap who's taking the saying, keep her lit, maybe a wee bit too literally. The parade has almost completed its course now, and in every single twist and turn, the crowd has behaved in a different way. What's most amazing is, when we try to control or change their behavior, they come right back at you with a new way of changing it, changing it themselves. 
The only difference is here is crowd control is so important in this scenario because if it doesn't work, everyone could get their fingers burnt or worse. to lift any of you now. If I need to, I will. Excuse me. Sorry. Of course, being Belfast, the crack is going on in pubs and bars well into the night, and this is where a new phase of crowd safety kicks in. But Andrew is still always watching the crowd density. See how ram this street is? Oh, my gosh. Um, that's that's four per square meter. Yeah, and yeah. you're not going to fit. It's going to be a disaster. And if one yeah. person trips over, everyone trips it's over a the front, and then somebody might die. Yeah. That's why you have to be very careful with the crowds. We have staff prisons just over here and here. Yeah. And if that gets too dangerous, we will stop people going in. We don't want to stop people going in, but we will if we have yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, if you need to. This evening is brilliant for Belfast, you know, I mean, Culture Night happens once a year and we can see that when Belfast shines at its best, the crowd come together to show what they do best and that's get together, have a good party, have a good time and do it safely and without any hassle or nonsense. Um, I think that's the image Belfast needs across the world and it's here, it's not contrived, you know, and, and you know, the crowd did that themselves, really. I suppose what I got from Culture Night was that I was in the midst of a crowd that thought for themselves. This was a free-thinking crowd. So what about the mental manipulation? I'm a mentalist after all. I've always read about cults, where large groups of people adopt the thoughts of just one person. Like this crowd, the Moonies, or followers of Reverend Sun Myung Moon in South Korea. He started his own religion and held mass wedding ceremonies for those who followed his doctrines. What makes a crowd of individuals subject themselves to the will of just one leader? Back in London, I'm meeting with a leading authority on cults. For everyone's protection, his work is shrouded in secrecy. So we're meeting in an undisclosed location. He has good reason to be careful because of his first-hand experience being controlled by a cult. When I was recruited into uh, a cult, I was living in Toronto, Canada at the time, and uh, that's where the group was based. And uh, my involvement in the group was fortunately very brief, uh, even though it still took me 11 months to fully recover. Sure. Cults use various techniques to recruit people, um, techniques of mind control, and we've listed 26 of them. One of them is hypnosis. It will usually be disguised as something else. It might be disguised as some new form of meditation or relaxation, anything you want to hear other than the real thing. There's often a change of diet to deprive the nervous system of necessary nutrients to help the person to function abnormally and help break them down. Um, sleep deprivation is very similar because it helps to break people down physically as well. There's tremendous peer group pressure to uh, conform to the wishes of the, the group at all times. So peer group pressure is a, is sure. a technique. I'm going to do my own experiment into peer group pressure. These four people are in on it. Unknown to the victim, they're members of the David Mead cult, otherwise known as my production team. We're going to pick a random person off the street who will believe that you're all random people off the street as well. And I'm going to have you all answer a really simple question. Which one of these lines, one, two or three, matches X? And you will all answer honestly. And in this case, you would say... Three. 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 And that would be a correct answer, gold star for all four of you. But at one point, the point at which when I take my glasses off, uh, you will deliberately lie. 
And then you will agree with that lie, you will agree with that lie, you will agree with that lie. And the hope is that our mark will also agree, even though they know that what they're saying is untrue. Hiya. Yeah. Hello, I'm David. How are you? Nice Lovely. Grab a wee seat. Hiya. Yeah. I'm David. Hi. Hiya. Grab a wee seat there. Hiya. I'm David. I want to see if the victim will ignore the evidence in front of their own eyes and go with the group who are deliberately telling a lie. Thank you for helping me out. I really appreciate it. What are you out doing? Shopping or...? OK, brilliant. Buy anything nice? No, not yet. OK, good. Well, all that's going to happen is I'm going to show you a series of cards. And what you're all going to have to do is decide which one, one, two or three, do you think matches X? And in this case, you would say... Two. 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 Uh, two. It's hard for me to see from up here. Three. 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 One. 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 We'll just go through these one last time. Three. 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 Two. 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 Lovely. What you might not have realised is they were all my friends and you were the only one um, oh. that was <laughs> in the oh, experiment. No. So, um, But you did absolutely brilliantly. I don't yeah. know if you know it or not, but four times in a row uh, you said the answer that you knew mm -hmm. wasn't the right answer. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we can probably quite clearly see in this one here, X is, uh, is equal to 2 in that mm -hmm. one. Um, but two times in a row you said that it was equal to 3. Yeah. And in this one... Um, uh, X is equal to 2 in that one, but uh, two times in a row you said it was equal to 1. And you did that with quite a few of them, actually, but you did do it four times. Mm -hmm. So was it, did, did it feel awkward? A wee bit, it was but just because I think I was the one on the end and yeah. everyone else was saying it and I thought, I don't know, it made me doubt myself because yeah. everybody was so certain. Yeah. But I just sort of followed the crowd. <laughs> of course, following the crowd can get serious. The infamous Charles Manson used peer group pressure to turn these cult followers into murderers. In a cult, it's harder to stick up for your own views against the group. Theoretically, all a cult needed, needs to do is to sit down and talk to this person and manipulate them, and then send them out to recruit two more people. And they come in and he manipulates them, and then the three of them go out and they bring in more people and so on, and it grows exponentially. So they could control a room of maybe 100, 200 people, yes. controlling them in concert, I suppose, much like, yeah. a, um, much like a conductor, but instead of instruments. And the people. thing is, when you're told that you can't ask questions because there's too much material to go through and not enough time, so please keep your questions to yourselves. If you think about it, though, who the question is in life anyway? That person we all remember at school that always had his hand up, the one with the ego problems, right? Do you want to be seen to be the person really? with the ego problems? I don't think so. So everybody that's new and isn't yet a member of the group is actually working against you because you don't want to stand up and make a fool of yourself in front of them. Hi, there. How are you? What's your name? Claire. Claire, I'm David. Grab Hello. a wee seat there. Hi, what's your Hi, name? Sinead. Sinead, I'm David. Grab Hi, a seat. Need. Need. Grab a seat. Brilliant. I'm on a roll. I want to carry on and recruit another new cult member. Quick as you can. Uh, three. 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 Two. Just do a couple more again. Uh, two. 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 One. I just, it's hard for me to see from up here. Uh, number one. 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 Three. Luckily, some people have control of their own minds. So, thank goodness, not everyone follows the crowd. Some of the lines from where I was sitting looked like, say, it was number two, whereas they were all going to say number three. So everyone was three, and I'm thinking, no, it's not, it's two. <laughs> Are they all seeing things, and they're thinking, because am I sitting over here, is it looking different? But I was doing a gong out my own head. But if Gustave Le Bon was writing about the crowd these days, where would he find them? 
I'm going to the new home of peer group pressure, where your friends' likes and dislikes are used to pressurise your every decision. Here, the crowd numbers in their thousands, millions, billions even. I'm going online. So, Jill, I've found out an awful lot about how retailers and, and even psychologists use the physical world and the physical environment to control people's behaviour and, and manipulate the way that they interact with the world around them. Yeah. But you're saying that quite a lot of those techniques cross over to the online world as well. They do cross over. So let me give you some examples. Quite often we are conditioned to have something like a walkway around the store. And what we have along the top, otherwise known as menu navigation, uh -huh. is a walkway. But unlike a walkway in the physical world, every move online is tracked and the store can adapt accordingly. Our online manipulators know exactly where we are and precisely how long it takes us to pass through the virtual space. In store we have line of sight. We have the same thing on websites. So typically people will always look up towards this side and then they will look across to the right hand yeah, side yeah. and then down to the left. So this is something that's called the golden triangle. It's more prevalent actually and more obvious when we look at Google. Describe that triangle to me again. They know when I arrive on a page where my eyes will go. Correct. And again, we have something called eye tracking software that help us see all of this. So we can see that you know a lot of people will look up around this menu, they will look down here and then they will look across here. But online stores can do something a real physical store could never do. They can effectively rebuild the store electronically, according to the behaviour of the people shopping, allowing the store to assert their ever-increasing dominance on the consumer. Without us having to necessarily mind-read individuals, we have systems to track all this that automatically rejig all of our menu navigation, i.e. our aisles, they merchandise automatically for us based on what based buyers... Based on the patterns of behaviour. Correct. So we monitor patterns of search or behaviour so that we can make sure that you're meeting with whatever most, is most appropriate for you. Slowly but surely, Jill, through time, me as a consumer, I've moved virtually all of my shopping online. But are we losing something by moving all of our purchasing online? Absolutely, you know, and I think that crowds are still a good thing. You know, we, we, we learn a lot from crowds. Um, you know, we're losing that community aspect. We're losing the, the physical interaction. But there are there are some connotations whereby, you know, we can see human nature is changing a little bit. So I've learned about dominance, complicity, peer group pressure and how all these tactics inform the science of crowd control. But now I'm going to step out of my comfort zone to work with this crowd of basketball players or, as you might call them, a team. If I'm really going to control these guys without using any mentalist skills whatsoever, then I need to be on top of my game. As a mentalist, I'm actually really interested in the real science of control and manipulation anyway, um, because I sort of pretend to do it on TV. So I suppose I'm fascinated to see if this works today. Can I, using nothing but words, control and manipulate 10 players to change the way that they behave? And not just in a tiny way, in a fundamental way. Oh! I have 10 players to play basketball today, and I'm going to divide them into two teams. One team will be the ones that I think are naturals at it, are naturally brilliant. The other ones are the ones that just aren't quite, uh, aren't quite as good as, let's call them the A team. The truth is, that's nonsense. I'm going to divide them randomly. I'm going to tell one team that they're brilliant, the other team that they're just not quite up to muster, and I'm going to see if that comes out in their performance. And there's no shortage of confidence among these young men. I am the best on the team, so <laughs> it's tough sometimes, like, carrying them on my back and stuff, but they'd realise, like, they'd say I would be the best, yeah. yeah. Good 10 out of 10, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that. I'd say that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't think I'm the best on the team, but they all tell me all the time like I'm the best on the team. <laughs> so the Mustang, I'm pretty easily. So. There's um, quite a lot of scientific research done on some of the most natural basketball players in the world. And it's to do, um, well, I don't, I don't want to tell you the exact details of it, but it's to do with the relationship between two particular joints on the arm uh, and natural capacity for basketball. And it's been recognized fairly recently over the last sort of two, three years. My job is to spot it and divide you into teams. Those who have that natural physiological thing that some human beings have that makes them naturally better at it and spot those of you that don't have it. And then just test and see which one performs best. A couple of you have heard of this. I've seen a couple of you have nodded. It had been on the one show and it had been on Discovery as well. Now, I suppose the interesting thing is that it's usually been done with people um, from their sort of 20s onwards. What age are you guys? All right, okay, so it may not be as easy to spot in, in your group, but of, there should be at least three of you have it, based on the statistics. All right, guys, so uh, you're gonna play for a couple of minutes. I need to watch you, and I'll call you whenever we're done. Let's go. Sorry, guys, last guy that had the ball, this uh, guy here in the blue T-shirt, you stand in the circle for me, please. Uh, uh, you, sir, as well, in, in the white circle, please. Cheers. The chap in the black bib, circle, please. Excuse me, sorry, uh, into the circle, please. I'm gonna say green twin, is that all right? Yeah, lovely, cheers, into the circle. These five are uh, pretty amazing, actually. I'm sure most of you seen the, the, the one particular thing that I was looking for. What's really interesting is, I didn't expect to get an even split, but you five are absolutely perfect for this experiment. So we'll, we'll still do something with you five, but you guys are absolutely brilliant for it. So what I need you all to do is take your left hand, hold it out for me. I need you to put on one of these each. But what's really important is this little dot, it's got a, a small, what's called a crystal compound in it. It's got to go on that line just past the tendon. So not on the tendon, just past the tendon. So just make sure that dot goes there. And that's a wee pink one for you, you're welcome. Um, so just make sure that it's just past the tendon, guys. Um, and you must make sure that the dimple side is on it, not the flat side, because the crystal compound is on the dimple side. Go ahead and do that there for me. So just, if you flex the tendon, shouldn't be on the tendon, should be just past it. Lovely. Good job. Go ahead and do that there. <laughs> you five are my dream team. And for that reason, you get my lovely white jerseys. There you go. There you go. Very good job. There you go. Good job. There you go. Excellent. Well done. Stick those on for me. Make sure that the face is sticking out the front because I like myself. You five, it almost certainly isn't going to work with you because you don't really have what, what I'm looking for, but we will still do something with you for the crack uh, just to, uh, to give you a reason for being out of school, if nothing else. Uh, so if you want to stick those on for me, but I appreciate you turning up anyway. Um, for the time being, we're only going to work with, the, with sort of, the, let's say, the A team. Um, so if you guys want to just go outside for a couple of minutes, um, you can catch your breath. Bye. Well Bye done. <laughs> Thanks for coming. All right, guys, so you're going to have an allocated amount of time. I want you to see how many times you can score inside the net. So can't wait to see it, guys. Whenever you're ready, let's go. Brilliant. The trick with positive affirmation for the A team is to subtly drop it in. Good shot. Then I just stand back and watch the positivity take effect. Yeah, you're hitting your flow now, lads. Brilliant, keep going. Dramatically outperforming the average. Honestly, this is amazing. Guys, you're re you've already smashed the record. See if you can get one more in, see if you can get one more in, and oh, that's time, that's time. Want to get the other team in to see just how well, uh, but you did absolutely amazing. Well done, round of applause for yourselves, well done. All right, so if, uh, if we can get sort of the B team in, please, if that's all right. So those guys did, um, we've done this a few times, and they, they've already smashed the record, all right? So all we're going to do is we're going to let you have a play as well, because you were good enough to turn up. So you're never going to touch that, but do your best anyway, all right? And uh, best of luck, you'll, uh, you'll need it. <laughs> Time starts now, go. The B team's determination to do well has got them off to a good start, but it only takes one miss. All right, guys, you've had more than half your time. And the drip, drip feed of my negativity really starts to bite. Come on, lads, there's a lot of misses. You can do it. A lot of misses. A lot of misses. Just gonna check time. 
We are five, four, three, two, one. All right, time's up, lad. Time's up, lad. You could have shot better, like it's yeah. You could have shot better. Um, yeah. You had a few misses in yeah. there, but what did that do to your confidence? We started well, like, but then it ended quite badly. So I think we started the good because we knew we wanted to beat the record. And then we were just rushing towards the end. So overall, lads, um, you guys did amazingly well. Uh, you smashed the previous record that we had. And be, being polite, you, they wiped the floor with you guys as well. You guys got a solid 20 versus 9 in the same allocated period. 20 versus 9. Let's hear for the winners, lads. Let me tell you um, a little bit about uh, this study and uh, I suppose about the science of it. Um, we talked you through the original study that was done about the relationship between uh, the two joints. It's totally fictional and made up. It doesn't exist. Um, I don't know anything about basketball and I don't know anything about joints. These are little kids bands that we bought out of, uh, out of uh, chemist this morning. They're supposed to help kids with travel sickness. Um, <laughs> but you guys in the same allocated time dramatically outperformed you guys. Why? Just because I told you that you would be better. And because I told you guys that you were somehow the B team or you really needed to wait outside while we were t testing the A team, well, that came out in your performance. And you guys, because I made you feel like the most special people in the world, like you guys are really the dream team, you are the guys who are going to smash the record. There is no record. This is the first time we've done this. Um, you dramatically outperformed. You performed doubly well to these guys in exactly the same allocated time. So I can assure you, it's nothing to do with the wristbands. It's nothing to do with your joints or your natural ability. Um, you just believed that you would do better, and you did do better. Before a game, you're trying to psych yourself up, and it, it just doesn't work. But if, if someone else is psyching you up, then it seems to work a lot better. He told us to put it beside our tendon just and it was like, help the joint that he was talking about. Uh, I'm wearing it every match now, that's me, yes. It works, so I'll find something that works. <laughs> I feel like weak-minded, you can just be convinced by something uh, someone's, someone's telling edge, you. Yeah. But you know what? That's one way of looking at it, that you're weak-minded. The other way of looking at it is you told yourself you were going to perform extraordinarily well, and you did. So you're not actually weak-minded, you're strong-minded. Just by thinking you're better at something, it came out in your performance. Do you need a hug? Is that what this is? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>